Happy Tuesday, everyone. Welcome back to Health Science One. So today we're gonna to be starting a new unit, Unit 1.03, talking about recognizing and responding to emergencies. Hopefully you have already watched the little introductory video that was about three minutes long talking about um, what it takes to be a first responder. So today we're gonna to learn about anaphylaxis, choking, and burns. And then we're gonna actually be doing a part two and potentially even a part three to this PowerPoint later this week. So some essential questions that you need to ask yourself today are what are the initial steps in responding to an emergency? We're gonna be talking about when you arrive on the scene of an emergency, what are the first things that you need to be doing in order to care for people that need help as well as keep everyone safe, including yourself. Which emergencies should be recognized by a first responder? So we're going to be discussing which ones take priority and need to have um, someone looked at by medical personnel versus the ones that are not priority and could be pushed to the side. And then what are the reasons to activate the emergency management system? So these are just three questions that you need to keep in mind as we go through this PowerPoint today. Oh, my screen's in the way, let me move you over. So do you have what it takes to be a first responder? Um, you should have watched the video this morning before you logged on to watch this. Um, so it talked about some of the things that they experience as first responders and the type of skills necessary to become a first responder, um, not only technical skills, but mental skills as well. It is a very difficult job. You see a lot of things that you probably never thought you would ever see in your life and probably don't want to see, but you are there to help people and take care of them. Um, so it's a very rewarding job as well. And for anyone who's interested in a fast paced work environment, emergency responding is probably great for you um, because you are constantly go, go, go. It is a very fast paced job and your adrenaline kicks in and you have to think quickly on your feet. So why is early recognition and response important? Number one, it saves lives. Um, you are the first person to arrive on the scene and you are the first person to assess the situation and be able to take care of them. Oftentimes in traumatic or emergency medical response um, or emergencies that are happening, time is money or time is the difference between saving someone and not saving someone. Um, some conditions or injuries may be life-threatening and so you have to take care of those people first in order to get them to the hospital and taken care of. It also helps shorten recovery time. There's actually scientific studies that have been conducted that prove that people that receive medical care before arriving to the hospital actually do have a shorter recovery time and are able to prevent long-term disabilities or long-term side effects. For example, stroke. If someone has a stroke, they need to receive medical attention as soon as possible because there is a medication that you can give to help um, treat stroke. And the sooner it is given, the soon, the better the outcome for the patient, basically. So if they don't receive medical care for many, many, many hours, then more than likely there's not going to be a lot that they can do to help that patient in terms of their stroke. So save lives, help shorten recovery time, and help prevent long-term disabilities. It also allows you as the emergency medical responder to provide for the victim's comfort. You as the emergency medical responder are there to not only treat the patient and take care of them medically, but one of the most important things with helping a patient recover from an injury or illness is providing for their personal and mental well-being and comfort. By keeping them comfortable, warm, hydrated, taken care of, taking care of their visible injuries or sicknesses, you are actually able to prevent them from going into shock, which is a really big deal. And then you're able to also help prevent the situation from worsening. Not only are you there to care for the patient, but you're also there to take care of everything else going on around you. Your focus is the patient, but you may have family members who are crying hysterically, or you may have cars and oncoming traffic you have to worry about or whatever it is. And so you as the emergency medical responder are in charge of making sure that the patient is taken care of and that the situation is not going to get worse than it already is. Let's talk about scene safety. Before attempting to render any first aid, you must ensure that the scene is safe, not only for the patient, but for yourself as well. You wanna keep yourself safe while you are doing your job. So you must always look around and check for safety, safety for yourself and safety for the victim. 
And you cannot help anyone if you become the victim yourself. This is really important to remember because, for example, you may be dealing with a traffic accident. If there's still oncoming traffic coming, then you're at risk of injuring yourself. And if you become injured, then you're not able to fill your job. They're going to have to call for backup. It's a whole situation that you want to avoid. Never put yourself in danger when trying to help others. So if you look at this picture here, you can see that there was a traffic accident, um, but I want you to kind of look around and see if you can find all of the different um, situations that could potentially be hazardous, okay? So just take a moment and look and see what you think could be a hazard in this scene, and then we're gonna talk about it. I'm gonna give you like five seconds. Okay, so the first one that you're going to want to notice is that down here, there's something leaking out of this car. Now, we don't know what that fluid is just from looking at the picture, but we could assume that it could be gas, it could be oil, and if it's something that's flammable, then we're at risk of a fire starting. So that's a big hazard. The second hazard is right here. There's broken glass on the road. So you want to make sure that you either try to get away from the broken glass or that someone else cleans up the broken glass so that you're not... Um, at risk of injuring yourself or the patient while you're trying to care for them. Over here, we can also see that there's a very low hanging traffic, or not traffic pole, a, um, a low hanging power line. It looks like they hit the pole, so now this power line is swooping down really low, and there is a family of people standing underneath it. So we're gonna wanna instruct those people to move away from where the power line is dangling. We also can see we have oncoming traffic coming, so someone's going to need to stop traffic and, can, and show them how to detour somewhere else. And we also have two guys playing soccer over here, which is not necessarily a hazard, but probably they should move somewhere else um, just to keep all the chaos to a minimum while you're trying to take care of the patient. Observe for possible dangers to you and the victim. That is the first thing that you're going to want to do when you assess the scene. Again, look for oncoming traffic, fire, smoke, hazardous liquids or gases, any type of wires, loose wires or dangling power lines, drugs. Are there any alcohol or drugs involved? Do you see any used needles on the scene? If there's any broken glass around the victim, if there's any violent situations like domestic disputes or um, civil disputes, are there any angry or aggressive people involved? And then biohazards include any body fluids or bleeding. So here we can see in this image, there's a big fire with lots of smoke. And then in this one, you can see that there is a lady that looks like she has passed out in her car. And if anybody can take a look and see what the hazard would be, it would be that she is still holding her used heroin needle. So the initial assessment, I'm going to move my little thing again. I keep being in the way. There you go. Initial assessment. The purpose of the initial assessment is to detect life threats, which may be dealt with first. Anything that is a life threatening illness or injury is the first priority when assessing a patient or a scene. Next is to assess the general condition and level of consciousness. You're looking for things like, is the patient alert? Are they responsive? Are they able to speak? Are they experiencing anything painful? Or are they completely unresponsive or unconscious? You want to check their airway. Is their airway open? Are there any liquids or debris that you can visibly see in their airway? Have them roll onto their side or help roll them onto their side and you wanna clear out the airway. You can use a head tilt and chin lift to keep the airway open unless a spinal injury is suspected. And a head tilt chin lift is basically where you place, uh, let me get a prop, hold on. This is our person's head. A head tilt chin lift Kind of looks like this. Doop. So they're laying on their back. You put your thumbs on their chin. You kind of hold the sides of their head and you tilt it back. And what this does is that helps to open up their airway more into a straight line. So if there is going to be any air that's able to make it through, that's going to help it the most. So a head tilt chin lift, you will learn that um, also when you take CPR next year in health science too. If there is a spinal cord injury, of course, you don't want to perform this because you don't want to be new, moving the neck. Um, so if you suspect that there could be a spinal cord injury, you would not use this. Breathing, you want to place your ear next to the victim's nose and mouth. And while you are placing your ear, there you go, 
placing my ear here, I'm also looking at their chest. So if they're breathing, I'm going to feel them breathing. I'm going to hear them breathing. But I'm also looking at their chest to see if I can see the chest rise and fall. And then circulation, you're going to be checking for pulse. Typically, on an adult, you are taught to check for carotid pulse if they're not breathing and radial pulse if they are breathing. So carotid is in your neck. So everybody take two fingers and go ahead and try to see if you can find your carotid pulse. There you go. Okay. And then take two fingers and see if you can find your radial pulse. It's going to be on your thumb side. Okay. So again, carotid if they're not breathing, radial if they are breathing. And then during this time, you also want to look and see if you see any uncontrolled breathing. I mean, bleeding. Sorry, uncontrolled bleeding. Okay. Let's talk about the Good Samaritan Law. It provides legal protection to people who give reasonable assistance to those who are injured, ill, in danger, or incapacitated. Basically, this means that if you were to step into a situation where someone is injured, ill, in danger of some type, or incapacitated, meaning they're unconscious or unable to care for themselves, and you step in to help, then you are automatically protected under the Good Samaritan Law as long as you are providing reasonable care. If you do anything that seems actually like extraordinarily out of the normal, um, you could be in danger of um, being sued for some reason. But most of the time, just providing a reasonable amount of care, caring for a person, using those first aid skills, you're going to be protected under Good Samaritan Law. Written to encourage bystanders to get involved in emergency situations without fear that they will be sued if their actions inadvertently contribute to a person's injury or death. Basically, what this is saying is the reason the Good Samaritan Law was created or written was to help make sure that bystanders, people standing around watching a situation happen, understood that they are protected and that they should step in and help. Because otherwise, if you think, you see something happen and you think, well, I don't want to step in because I could get in trouble or I could do something wrong, then no one will ever step in and that person will just never receive help. So the Good Samaritan Law was written to help encourage people to not be afraid of stepping in and helping because they are going to be protected in case something does go wrong. If someone is conscious, you do always have to ask for permission. If they are able to see, speak, and talk, or even if they can't talk, they can shake their head. You do need to ask them for permission. If someone is unconscious and cannot respond, consent is implied, meaning that they are, um, if they are unconscious, you are automatically allowed to help them without asking anyone. I will go ahead and let you know that there is a weird rule to this, and that is that um, if a person is over the age of 18 and they are conscious, say a you know, 20 year old, is choking and you ask them, can I help you? And they say, then you by law are not supposed to help them. Um, however, if someone is choking, eventually they're probably going to go unconscious because they're not able to clear their airway. If they're choking and they say, no, you can't help me, they shake their head, they're going to eventually go unconscious. And once they go unconscious, you guessed it, consent is implied. So that is a really rare situation and I've never really seen that happen, but it has happened somewhere in the world before. And if that does happen, just know that once they go unconscious, consent is implied. Also, if you are under the age of 18, consent is implied as well. So this week, you're going to be learning about all of these different types of medical emergencies. But today we're just learning about the first three, anaphylaxis, burns, and choking. And then later this week, we'll talk about drowns, fainting, hemorrhages, which are uncontrolled bleeding, poisoning, seizures, and then um, later we will, during the course of the semester, talk about how each of these relate to different organ systems in the body. So let's talk about anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock is an extreme life-threatening allergic reaction that causes airway constriction or, and low blood pressure. The most common um, anaphylactic reactions that we see are typically related to food allergies or bee stings. So peanuts is a very common one, um, bees, shellfish, or shrimp, or things like that. But then some people can also have allergic reactions to different types of fruits or vegetables or all kinds of things, chocolate. Um, so you can have an, uh, an allergy to a lot of different things, 
some people's allergies are very minor and they don't cause um, anaphylaxis, but some people have a very severe reaction to that allergy and it causes their lips to swell, their throat to close up. And then if your throat closes up, you obviously cannot breathe. Common causes are things like insect bites or stings, certain medications, foods like nuts, spices, and shellfish, chemicals, and other types of household products. Symptoms include a hives or a skin rash. So if you get like the bumpy little dots all over your skin, that's hives. You may have difficulty breathing, restlessness and anxiety, either a really rapid or a really weak pulse, altered mental status, meaning you might be kind of confused, dazed or out of it, swelling of the throat and tongue, and then low blood pressure. And the low blood pressure part is also very serious um, and needs to be taken care of immediately. So what do we do if someone is experiencing anaphylaxis? First, you need to see if an allergic reaction is suspected. You need to ask the patient if, they're, if they know they are allergic to anything and if they have been in contact with that substance. Um, oftentimes, especially like at the YMCA is where I have the most experience with this because we have a lot of kids that are allergic to different things. And typically, they know that they're allergic and they do have an EpiPen um, that we keep at the YMCA. But there have been circumstances where it's a young kid and they've never had peanut butter before and then they were exposed to it and they found out that they had an allergic reaction. So you always need to ask the person, are they allergic to anything that they know of and have they been in contact with that substance? If a patient is unresponsive, um, you can check to see if they're wearing any kind of identification medical jewelry. Um, sometimes they're like made of rubber or plastic. Sometimes they're really nice like metal like this one in the photo, but it'll just have their name, any allergies they have, and then um, usually a contact information on the other side. People with known allergies may also carry EpiPens. So be prepared to assist the patient with administration of an EpiPen if necessary. And before we actually move on to talk about burns, I'm gonna actually show you what an EpiPen looks like. This is an EpiPen trainer. Oh, upside down. This is an EpiPen trainer. So it is not a real EpiPen. It doesn't have any medication in it and doesn't have a needle in it. But basically it would look just like this. And you would take the person's EpiPen, you remove the blue cap, okay? You remove the blue cap from the bottom. And then you would have the person sitting or lying down, but for the purpose of the video, I'm gonna stand up, okay? You would have them lying down and you, oh, I'm running out of space back here. Okay. And you take the EpiPen, take the blue cap off, the needle's gonna come out of that end that the blue cap was on, and you're gonna put it in the side of their leg. You do it in the leg because there's a lot of muscle there. Um, you, jab it into the side of their leg. You want to push down pretty hard and then you push the orange button and you hold it in their leg for 10 seconds. Okay. You just hold it there for 10 seconds. And then after 10 seconds, you take it out. When the little top pops out like this, you know that the medication has been administered. Okay. So that is how an EpiPen works. If you've never had to use one, um, hopefully you never do have to use one, but that is how one functions. Okay, next let's talk about burns. Again, running out of space on my screen here. Okay. So burns can be caused by a variety of different things. It's not just, um, you know, something hot. Burns can be caused by radiation, sun, boiling water, chemicals, fire, or electricity. When we are assessing a patient's burns, we use a rule called the rule of nines. It measures the percent of the body burned. Basically, the body is divided into 11 different areas, and each part of the body is 9%. So if you look and you see that there, um, let's see. If you look and you see that their head and their neck are burned, that is 9%. And you can see that their left arm is also burned. That would be another 9% and their left leg is burned, that would be 18%, okay? So you add that up, nine and nine is 18, 18 and 18 is 36. So 36% 36 of their body is burned, okay? It does take some getting used to and studying this um, page, this the mat, to get the math right, um, but it's a really good way for emergency medical responders to kind of estimate 
how much or what percentage of the body is burned before they bring the person into the hospital. So there are also different classifications of burns. The first one is a first degree burn. And a first degree burn is just that your skin is pink or red. There's not really any blisterings or, and it's just moderately painful. A first degree burn would basically be like a sunburn. It means that you've only burned really through the top layer of the epidermis, as you can see here in the photo in the top corner. A second degree burn involves lower layers of skin and it can have redness and blistering. So a second degree burn means we've gone a little further down into the dermis area and we'll start to actually see those white blisters um, pop up on the top of the skin and typically more painful. And then a third degree burn involves the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous layers. Loss of skin and blackened skin may appear and may be life-threatening. So down here you can see the third degree burn, it is black, like charcoal. Um, some of the pieces of skin might be falling off. So what do we do to care for burns? If it's a minor burn, you're going to want to cool the burn under cool running water. Do not ever put ice on a burn. That is only going to make it worse. You just want to have cool running water, like out of a faucet. You want to also remove any rings or other tight jewelry or items from the burned area. So for example, like I have a ring on, if I were to burn my hand, I would want to get that ring off immediately because my finger is probably going to start to swell and you don't want this stuck on your finger while your finger is swelling. Also, you never want to break any blisters. You want to wrap them in a very loose gauze to protect the blisters, um, but you do not want to actually try to pop them or break them. This could lead to infection um, and cause them to not heal as well as they should. For major burns, you're going to want to call 911. So anything like a second or third degree burn, you're probably going to want to, definitely a third degree, depending on how bad the second degree burn is or how much of the body it um, is affecting, you're going to want to call 911. In order to protect the surf, protect from further injury, you also need to make sure that the source of the burn is off before um, you approach. So if it is an electrical burn, then you're going to want to make sure you turn off the inner, the um, whatever is the electricity is running through. You also want to make sure the person is breathing and do not place large burns in water as they may cause hypothermia. Oh, and watch for shock. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about choking. This is our last um, topic for today. Choking occurs, of course, when an object gets lodged in the throat and is blocking the flow of air. The universal sign for choking is this. It's the hands grasping the throat. But, of course, not all people will do this, but this is typically like your first instinct if you're choking. You need to always ask the person if they're choking. I like, you know, they're doing this. I just walk up to them and say, hi, my name is Emily, and I am a first responder. Um, I'm trained in first aid. Can I help you? And they'll do this. If the person is able to speak or cough, like they say, yes, you can help me, then you need to just stay with them and encourage them to continue coughing because they'll probably be able to dislodge whatever it is on its own. It also is a chance that they could become worse, so you definitely need to be there to take care of that. Um, other indications of someone um, choking is the inability to talk. If they are having difficulty breathing or they're making noisy wheezing sounds, if their skin, lips, or nails start turning blue, um, if their skin appears flushed and then it turns pale or blue, um, that could be a sign that they are choking because it turns it, it turns flush because they panic. And then when they start to lose air, um, then it starts to turn blue. And then, of course, if they go unconscious as well. If the person is choked, um, you need to help them with the Heimlich maneuver or what is also known as the abdominal thrust. And we're gonna talk about that here in a second. Okay, so the Heimlich maneuver or abdominal thrust, you simply, you take your fist, okay? You wanna put thumb side right above the person's belly button, okay? It is totally fine if you want to ask them, hey, can you point to your belly button for me? Because what that does is it helps them to remove their hands, 
get them away from their throat. They point to their belly button, and then that lets you know where you need to place your hand. So you're going to place your hand thumb side right above the belly button. You're going to put your other hand around their, your, you're going to put your other hand on your hand, and you're going to be pulling in and up, in and up, okay? It's kind of like a J shape, a J shape, in and up, okay? So you will do that five, um, in CPR you'll learn how to do this properly, but you basically do the Heimlich maneuver five times, and then you bend them over and you hit them on the back five times and you go back and forth. Um, if you're doing a Heimlich maneuver on a pregnant woman, you can always go further up on the abdomen. And if you're doing Heimlich maneuver on someone who is really small, like a child, you want to crouch down and get on their level. Also, if you have to do it on a person who's much taller than you, you can ask them to get down on their knees and do it that way. We'll talk all about that more um, when we get to CPR and health science too, but these are kind of the basics. So that is anaphylaxis, burns, and choking. Um, you have a few assignments you're going to complete for today, and then we will continue on with this lesson throughout the week. Have a great day, guys.